You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel, Lord, to give up. I'd be a fool, you are my own in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. safe place, Lord, giving us hope, future. Regardless of what's going on around us, Lord God, we know that you will never leave us, never forsake us, Lord. We bless you. We bless you, Lord. We don't deserve it. Thank you for your love.
Jesus, Lord of heaven. I do not deserve grace that you have given. Your love is high, your love is all we 
Thank you this morning, Lord, for expressing your love to us through Jesus Christ. I want to thank you that your love is greater than anything. We ask this morning, Lord, that you would express your love in a deep way, Lord, as we study the Word of God and that you would give us understanding and wisdom, Lord God. We pray, Lord, for the Holy Spirit to bring us into a place of intimacy, Lord God, concerning the Word of God, Lord. And we know it's the Word of God that changes us, Lord God, that works in the depths of our heart, Lord. So reveal yourself to our hearts today, Lord God. And Father, whatever you want, do in us today. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> we want to thank those who gave shoes for the victims or the fire victims up in paradise we delivered 200 almost 200 pairs of shoes and when I talked to the pastor up there he said we are out of shoes we need shoes badly so we were able to give 200 new pairs of shoes to those fire victims and they were taken right away so I want to thank you for doing that um, also we have a work day tomorrow at 9 o'clock for the men who want to come down and if you ladies if you want to we don't really think it's a great idea only because it's out there in the cold and this heavy work and so we'll be clean up the new property over here right that joins us at nine o'clock tomorrow if you want to come so please do it nine o'clock tomorrow if you have your bibles turn with me to the book of luke chapter three this morning <clears throat> luke chapter three are you guys tired this morning You know, I looked at a congregation, I sometimes will uh, look at different people in, in the sense of uh, different services, and I was looking at one the other day, in fact, it was yesterday, and as I was looking at the congregation, because they put the camera on the congregation, and it was like, and my thought was this, I sure hope this is not how you are. <laughs> <clears throat> so let's go to the book, book of Luke chapter 3 continuing in the book of Luke chapter 3 verse 1 through 14 it says this now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea Herod being tetrarch of Galilee his brother Philip tetrarch of Atura and the reasons of 
Trachonitis, and Lysianus, tetriarch of Abilene, while Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he went into all the regions around the Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the word of Isaiah, the prophet saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, <clears throat> and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked place shall be made straight, and the rough ways smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Then he said to the multitude that came out to be baptized by him, Brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Therefore bear fruit of repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father, for I say to you that God is able to raise up the children of Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the tree. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. That the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? He answered and he said to them, He who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. Then the tax collectors also came to be baptized, and he said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than what is appointed for you. Likewise the soldiers asked him, saying, And what shall we do? So he said to them, Do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely, and be content with your wages. In the last couple of days, I've been kind of contemplating different things concerning what God does and how miraculous Jesus was and the things that he did while he walked the earth. And my thoughts came to a scripture about a man named Jairus. Jairus was a man that he was the head of a synagogue and he was li literally in a place of where he was in a religion in the Jewish religion and he was you could say one of the highest people in that place not of course above the high priest or anything else like that but he was in a high place and his father his daughter became sick and so he had to go against everything that he was standing for concerning his religion concerning his position concerning people but his love for his daughter was so great that he didn't care about those things. The most important thing was his daughter, and his daughter was very sick. And so what he did is he went to Jesus, and he said this to Jesus. Jesus, my daughter's sick. Will you come with me, and will you heal my daughter? And Jesus says, yes, I will. And as Jesus was going to this place of Jairus' house, a lady reached over and grabbed a hem of Jesus' garment, and she said, if I can only touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. And the scripture teaches that literally she becomes completely healed. Spending all her money, being totally broke and being without, she, the last straw is Jesus. And Jesus heals her. And Jesus makes a statement. And though he's amongst all many people, he says, who touched me? And the disciples said to him, what do you mean who touched you? Look at the throng among you. And Jesus said, somebody touched me because power went out from me. And the lady said, it was me, it was me. And she got healed. And so Jesus is on his way back and or, or on the way to uh, <clears throat> Jairus' house. And Jairus' servant said, tell the master to forget it because your daughter is dead. And Jesus said, disbelieve. She's only sleeping. And Jesus went and ended up healing her and raising her from the dead. And I thought about that and I thought, you know what, these are miraculous things that nobody can deny who Jesus is, the Messiah. And my thoughts went to a place of where, you know, I, I would really love to see Jesus do those things. And I've seen Jesus do miraculous things in people's lives concerning cancer, concerning people who've been demon-possessed. I've seen those things. And they're spectacular. But I believe this morning that God wants to do something supernatural in every single heart, and he does it through the word of God. 
something that is more miraculous than even things that we call miracles. And what that is, is a changing of a heart. <clears throat> you see, God wants to speak to you today, and God wants to work in your heart, and God wants to change you. God wants to work in you. And as many people that are here this morning, only God can do that. No pastor can do that. It has to be by the Spirit of God, the Word of God, changing the hearts of God's people. And only God can do that. My point is this. When you get done with this teaching, when we're done with this teaching today, it is God's heart and God's desire for you not to be the same. But you're going to have to respond to what God wants you to know. It's up to you and how you respond. So let's go into this book we call the book of Luke, chapter 3. <clears throat> the last chapter we learned that Jesus was 12 years old and he was about his father's business already. John the Baptist is now, and we see between these chapters about a jump of 18 to 20 years. So between chapter 2 and chapter 3, there's an 18 year difference to 20 years. And now all of a sudden, John the Baptist begins to start his ministry. It has been proclaimed by the book of Isaiah that a man would come and he would do the work of God. He would be a man similar to Elijah. It has been proclaimed by his father Zacharias at his birth that he would be a prophet and he would go before the Lord. And now it's time for John to begin to do what God has called him to do. Now, before we go into the scripture, John, from his, before his birth, has been set apart for God's purpose and God's plan. And John is in the desert for a period of time. We don't know exactly how many years because we don't know in the sense of how long he stayed with his mom and dad and then went into a desert, but we know for sure he was in a desert, deserted place for a few years. And after God is all done with John and prepared John, now John is in the place of where God says, it's time for you to fulfill what I have called you to do with your life personally. <clears throat> and I say that with this in mind. Is John that great of a man the Bible says first of all that he was the greatest and Jesus makes a statement so when if Jesus says it you know you can bet on it that John was the greatest prophet in the Old Testament so we know for sure that John was a great man but Jesus made this same statement he said that the least in the kingdom of God is greater than John so are you a Christian? If you are a Christian today, then you are greater than John. And I say that again with this thought in mind, that if God had a plan for John's life before his birth, is it possible that the all-knowing God who created everything and holds everything in his hand has a plan and a purpose for your life? And the answer is yes. The Bible teaches that God knows your life before and he knows every single day that's going to happen. He sees every day before it happens concerning your life. That's pretty intricate. That's pretty awesome, really. At the same time, a little bit scary. So John is in the place of where now he is going to begin his ministry. And we're going to see the start of his ministry and how it how God uses John in a mighty way. Verse 1. Now the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Princess Pilate, <clears throat> being governor of Judea, Herod, being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of the Aetoria, and the region of Trachonitis, <laughs> and Lysianus, tetrarch of Abilene. Now, so what we're, they're doing is... Luke is the physician, he's a smart man, he's a wise man, and now he's a histor historian at the same time. So he's telling the history, and what he's, we're getting out of this is the leaders, and what, we can, what can come from it literally is when this time of ministry is happening. So it's 29 AD that this is happening, that John is beginning his ministry. 
So we're not going to really go through these other guys. Verse 2. With Annas and Caiaphas were high priests. The word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. Let's go over a couple of these characters. Annas and Caiaphas. These were men. One of them were... Well, first of all, they both became high priests, which is the highest position for spiritual men in ministry. One of them were appointed by Pontius Pilate as a leader, the spiritual leader, and one of them were appointed by God. And these are men that are supposed to speak for God to the people. They are to offer sacrifices. They are to be in control of all the spiritual things that happen. But these men have not heard from God for 400 years. From the time of the book of Malachi until the book of John, you can see that God can't speak to his spiritual leaders because they won't listen. For the first time, God finds a man named John who is going to listen, who is going to hear what God has to say, and then he's going to do what God tells him to do. Notice what it says here. The word of the Lord came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. His whole life, its meaning, its purpose would do exactly what God had told him to do. And we're going to see in a moment what God speaks to him. It's a heavy thought to think that God himself would speak to man, to speak to John, that God would speak to you. In the book of James, it speaks this and says this, that anyone who lacks wisdom, let him pray and ask God to give him wisdom from above. We have a board in our church and the board makes decisions on different things that we're going to spend money on, where we're going to go, what we're doing on these certain things. And our thoughts are always, okay, God, we want to pray and ask you for wisdom. And we believe that God does give us wisdom, that God shows us exactly what he wants us to do and how he wants to do it. Now, if we didn't believe that God was going to give us wisdom, we shouldn't pray at all. We shouldn't ask God. My point is that God wants to speak to you, that God wants to give you wisdom. If there's something that you want to hear from God, God wants to speak. And if our hearts are in a place of where we say, like John, okay, God, I'm ready to do ministry. I'm ready to do whatever you want me to do. If you will speak to me and you will instruct me and show me in which way you would have me to go, I will say what you want me to say. And it is not always the most popular thing to do, as we will see in just a moment. If you think that when you ask God what his will is, that God's going to say, what do you think? What's your idea concerning this? What's your plan? If you think that's what God's going to do, you've got the wrong God, but, and there's only one God. God will tell you. But God will also have to be listened to and heard. I have to say this before I go on. It is true that John's time of the desert, in the desert, is over. He will do the will of God. But he has been prepared to do God's will by God, number one. And he has been prepared to do God's will by his parents also. It is important that we understand that we prepare our children for the purpose that God has for their lives in the future. And how we do that is we pray for our children, number one. 
Number two, we bring our children to church that they may learn about God and His ways. That we, by example, portray the fruits of God and a relationship with God. And that we, by example, serve God that they also would know that they are to serve God. And that we, by our example, love God, that our children may love God. It is important that we prepare our children for what God has called them to do. God has a calling on every one of your children. God has a plan for every one of your children. And it is our job as Christian parents to teach our children these things. No excuse. You know, I've had parents say this to me. Well, I don't want them to be forced to do something that would not want that they would not want to do it later when they get older. I don't want them to for, I don't want to force them to go to church. I don't want to force them to read their Bible. I don't want to force them to pray. I don't want to force them. I don't want to but we force them to go to school. We force them to learn things that are totally contrary to what God says, but we don't give the antidote for that lie and that deception by telling them and teaching them the truth. That's our responsibility. Now, we're going to see what God speaks to John in the next verses, verse 3 through 6. And he went into all the region around the Jordan. And this is what he did. He preached the baptism of repentance for the remissions of sin. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled with every mountain and hill, and hill brought low. And the crooked place shall be made straight and the rough ways smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of the Lord. So this is the things that God sp has spoken to John that he is to bring forth. So he is to preach to Herald. And I want to read this word to you because there's a couple words in the Greek that I want to give you a deeper understanding or a full understanding. <clears throat> to be a herald or officiate as a herald, to proclaim after the manner of a herald, always with the suggestion of formality, gravity, and authority, which be, must be listened to and obeyed. To publish, proclaim openly something which has been done, used by the public proclamation of the gospel and matters pertaining to it, made by John the Baptist, by Jesus, by the apostles, and other Christian teachers. So in other words, he's saying that every single one, Jesus, also did the same thing, the apostle did the same thing, and all Christian teachers. This was John's constant thought and idea his whole time of ministry. This is what John did. Proclaimed really the news of the Messiah coming but he proclaimed repentance as we will see John will be the forerunner of Jesus Christ the King and here he calls the people to repent for the kingdom of heaven he says is at hand The people had not been obeying the Lord during John's time. They had not kept the statutes and the commandments of God. They walked in their own ways. They served themselves. And John was trying to prepare them to meet God in the flesh. He was trying to prepare them to meet Jesus Christ who was going to make himself known in a short period of time. I want you to notice something that's really important, that the command here is personal, and it's something that you must do. The prophet said, prepare to meet your God, and this is exactly what John was trying to do. It was a preparation that was an inward preparation of the heart, to meet the king. 
Beloved, there is a necessary preparation to meet God. John calls this true repentance. Now, I want you to look at me because I... And the reason why I say that to you to look at me is because I want you to, don't want you to be seen by me, but what I want you to do is I want you to be attentive to what God has for you concerning these thoughts. We're talking about repentance now. What is exactly what is repentance? Or what does it mean to repent? It is more than just saying you are sorry. Real repentance is being so sorry, so contrite, that you do not repeat the offense again. If a person declares that they have repented of a certain action of sin and they continue in the same action, there is a good reason to doubt the genuineness of repentance. Love it. For God to work in a life, the first step is a true turning away from sin. And this happens when we encounter the kindness and the goodness of God. As Paul wrote, the goodness of God leads you to repentance. When we realize that God is merciful, gracious, loving, and willing to forgive our transgression, that is when our heart is softened toward repentance. Without true repentance, and listen, there is no real forgiveness. If you have harbored secret sin in your life and you have not genuinely turned away from it, maybe you've just become better at hiding your sin and more carefully about covering your basis. Don't deceive yourself. God knows your heart. He knows your sin. And God will not be mocked. Meditate on the goodness of God. Think about His love for you. His abounding mercy and His willingness to not only forgive you, but to change your life and to help you conquer the destructive desires. Forsake the sin, turn from it with finality and receive the forgiveness and the cleansing of God. So why is it necessary to prepare the way for the Lord? No man can stand before the holy God in a sinful state without being consumed. The heart were not prepared for the visitation of the righteous king. I believe that the message John brought forth was relevant for those days. You see, what was happening in this place is that there were gangs, there were people who were in total sin and total rebellion against God and the word of God. They were a first me generation. They committed crime after crime after crime. They would see victims that needed help and they wouldn't help. So my thought is, if those things were happening then, and John was trying to prepare them to meet the king, Jesus, Is it necessary or is there a purpose that we need to have within our heart to prepare us to meet, up, meet the King? I believe that we as Christians need to prepare ourselves more than we ever have concerning to meet the Lord. I believe that every pastor needs to prepare the way for their congregation. I believe that the king is on his way and he will be coming very soon. And if you think that those are just words, you're fooling yourself. There's more lawlessness now than I believe there's ever been. And we see it growing by leaps and bounds. The heart of many are waxing cold. When we see the abortion, we see the murdering of their own children, we see a life, many lives that are totally set on just this world. Many of the people in the church today are not prepared to meet God in any way. Should he come today for his church, many people in the church 
would be left behind concerning the great tribulation and would go through the great tribulation. The moral condition of the world today is much as the same as it was during John's time. And this is the sad part. The church, so-called the church, is almost identical to the same sins of the world today. I cannot believe how relevant this message is that John brought then as it is for today. As I listen and study different churches and different pastors and how they're changing their thinking and how they're not calling sin, sin anymore and how sin doesn't really separate you from God because I don't believe that sin, they say. And God says it's sin and it's always been sin and since this time of the world it's now not called sin God's supposed to say you know what then it's not it's total foolishness and God himself says there must be repentance I said to you earlier that this is something that can change and do a miraculous thing in your heart but in order for that to happen there has to be a looking honestly about within my own heart to see if there's things I have to repent of. I want to get personal now, again. This week I was over helping doing some stuff on the property. And as I was doing something on the property, of course, things happen no matter where you go. You can't hide yourself from things. And a young man came across the property on his bike. And I said to him, I said, you can't go on the property. You, you can't be on there. This is why we got fences over here. This is all private property. And he says, the bomb word, off. And this is my thought as he's saying this. I'm just kind of like, Ooh. he's about 17 years old. And I'm thinking, I wish I was... No, I wasn't. I was thinking that. Do you know what I'm talking about? Okay, you know how you feel inside when you get a kid that just says something to you and you want to go back in the flesh and you want to grab him by the... And, uh, and I'm thinking, okay. And so I kept on working. The guy threw, the, he threw his bike over the fence, jumped over the fence and, you know... And when I got home that night, I was thinking about it because, you know, at that point, I kept on working and stuff. And I got home at night and I'm thinking about it and thinking about it and thinking about it. And this is what the Lord spoke to me. He said, you know what? You could have handled that differently. I know I could have grabbed him by, no. <laughs> you could have handled that differently. You could have handled that with a lot more love but he wouldn't have listened, Lord. My point is, I had to be honest with God in the sense of, I could have handled it with a lot more love. And so I said, okay, God, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I was wrong, 100%. I shouldn't have done it that way. And God's working in my heart to be unconditional, concerning, loving, no matter who they are, no matter what they say. And I know it has to be a dying to self and denying self, and that's what God's trying to do. But I had to look at things in the sense of, even though I didn't do wrong, was my heart right? And I had to repent, and I had to repent concerning that. And many times, we don't look and be, or we're not honest with ourselves concerning what's going on in our hearts, and we're not honest with God in the sense of repenting. I personally believe that every single Christian today needs to repent of something. And, because, and the reason is, in order to meet God the way that you want to meet God, your heart has to be right before God, and we need to repent. I'm still repenting from things I did 100, year, 100 years ago. I'm not that old, I promise. It just seems like 100 years ago. 30 years ago, I'm still repenting of things. That I, that I did 30 years ago or 40 years ago. My point is, the body of Christ 
needs to repent. It doesn't mean you're in total sin. It doesn't mean that. God's worked in your heart and done a lot of wonderful things. Why does God want us to repent? Because things that are between us and God hurt our fellowship with God. Sin always does destruction. It always takes us away from God. It causes pain. Here's what the scripture says in Proverbs. There's a way that seems right to man, sin, but it leads to the road of destruction. That's the truth of it. Now, John says here, for the remission of sins. Repentance for the remission of sins. Let me read that word to you, remission. Release from bondage or imprisonment, forgiveness or pardon of sin, letting them go as if they never had been committed, the remission of the penalty. So in order for the remission to happen, the Bible teaches that there must be repentance. You know, when I first became a Christian, this is what I was told. Just confess, God will forgive you no matter what. And it's true, partly. If I confess, it's true that God will forgive me. But along with that goes that big R word. Repentance. Period. It is God's heart to forgive man's sin. And that's why he sent Jesus. It's not a sin that God will not forget a, forgive a Christian. I want to read a scripture to you. And this is David speaking of this. And he says about his forgiveness. And what was going on in his heart. Concerning his sin. Listen to what it says in Psalms 32. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. Whose sin is covered. Blessed is a man whose spirit there is no deceit. While I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning. All the day long, for day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. Salah, I acknowledged my sin to you, O Lord, and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. God said David was a man after his own heart. Which partly means this. That David never committed the same sin again that we know in scripture. So in other words. When David would confess his sin. He would repent from what he had done against God. That was a man after God's heart. Now God is looking for people. Men. Men and women to be after his own heart. And God gives us the ability through the Spirit of God when we accept him that the power of sin has been broken in our lives that we no longer have to sin. Now we as Christians choose to sin. And David's sin was a great sin. It was no easy sin. That led to another sin. His sin of adultery led to murder. And God forgave him. Notice that the hand of God was upon David's heart. And when it was, David had no rest. Day and night, he says, his conscience plagued him. Day and night. Remember, sin is pleasurable for a moment. But it is a short-lived moment. One moment of pleasure can cause a person years of grief and heaviness, as it did David. Maybe you're experiencing the same thing that David felt. The guilt, the shame, the heavy hand of God. God promises, if you will come and you will confess the sin, that will forgive you. But God also says, there has to be a re. Repentance. I can't emphasize that word strong enough. I can't emphasize it enough. Concerning dealing with sin in our hearts and in our lives. Confessing and repenting. Now, it says here, 
prepare the way of the Lord, make the path straight. This is what John was supposed to do. When a king would go forth and before he went out to the land, he would, they would send couriers out there and men and women to go out and tell them to fix the roads up, tell them to get their houses clean and everything all situated. So when the king came out, he would be able to approve with what was happening. And how did they prepare that? The Bible says here that they made their path straight. John sort of repeated this when he said, make their crooked path straight. See, some of these people were crooked. They were cheating others. They were gaining through fraud and deceit. And so they had to have their past straightened. Now, you and I have a life that God wants to work in. And all of us, listen, have crooked places. Not me, Pastor. Did you hear that, Lord? It's not true. All of us, God's working in. And God wants to make those paths straight. He goes on and speaks about what John's supposed to do. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill brought low. The valley here is a depression in the surface of the landscape that were to be filled. So let's talk about, just for a moment, and I'm not getting sidetracked, about this thing called depression. Much of depression, and every one of you are going to deal with that sometime or another, comes from selfishness. We are thinking too much about ourselves. We need to be thinking more about others. Jesus taught us and continues to teach us about loving others more than ourselves. Our Lord was a perfect example of serving others. If you're dealing with a lot of depression today, here's a great antidote. Love God first and others second. Let self be crucified with Christ, die to self, that you may be free when your eyes are not on the in the book of first kings the bible describes a man his name was jeroboam he was the king of israel at this time of history that we're talking about in kings there were two nations israel was divided it was judah which had two tribes and then there was israel which had 10 tribes and in that, Jeroboam became king of the ten tribes and he decided he was going to make things easier for the people. So what he did is he built two, really, idols, so to say, calves. And he put one in Bethel and he put one in Dan. And he said to the people, you know what? It's just too far to go to Jerusalem. It's way too far. I'm going to make it easier for you just to go to these places. You see, they would have to travel a long way. And what he was trying to do is he was trying to make religion easier. The relationship we have with God on God's part is everything that we need for life and for godliness. But on our part, there are things that we have to do. And it's not always easy. Being a Christian is the hardest thing that you'll ever do in your life. Because let me tell you what it takes to be a real Christian. It takes this, to deny yourself, take up your cross, and to follow Christ. It's not easy religion. Anyone who says to you, you know what, you just need to come to church. That's all you need. Nothing else matters, you come to church. You just need to read your Bible whenever you get a chance. And whenever you feel like it and something's happening in your life, pray. 
and then live your life just normal. Everything else, just let it flow. It's, if you've been a Christian for a period of time, do you, that's kind of foolishness, isn't it? I'm not saying you don't pray. I'm not saying you don't go to God's house. I'm not saying that. But how many times do you have to deny yourself? A lot of times you have to say, no, I'm not doing that. No, I'm not going there. No, I'm not dealing with that. No, no, no. And yourself says you on a continual basis, doesn't it? Yourself, hey man, it's okay. You, you know, you deserve this. It's okay if you do this. You know, God will forgive you. It don't matter. You know, it's not going to... I'm always fighting with me. My old nature. I hate that old man. And I hate the way he is. And if you don't hate hit that old man, you're going to be in trouble. You're going to listen to him. And he's not a wise person. You see... Christianity, true Christianity is a walk and it's a dying to self on a regular basis. Paul didn't give us a scripture in Galatians 2.20 just for the fun of it. This is what Paul said. I, 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 me, put your name in there. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, but not I. Not I again. But Christ in me. And the life that I now live is through faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, this is important that we understand that. And when we live that kind of life, the Christian life, depression kind of melts away. In our society, we're taught to just think about ourselves. My life, your life's about you, man. That's how they get you a lot of times. Now, he says the crooked places have been made straight, will be made straight, and will be made smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of the Lord. And then he goes in verse 7, Then he shall say, he said to the multitude that came out to be baptized, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from this wrath to come? John has not been to the school of how to manipulate people. He tells things exactly like they are. He holds nothing back. And why is this? It's so important. Their souls and eternity are at stake. He's trying to prepare them to meet Jesus. And he has to be honest. He has to tell them the truth. Now, couldn't John have done that with a little bit more love? You know, it is important that we as Christians always tell people in love. But the Bible teaches that we to always tell them the truth. And the truth is not always easy. How many like to tell their children the truth in the sense of it's going to start a controversy or how many to like to tell their wives or their husbands the truth when you know it's going to cause a problem you see as Christians the Bible teaches that we are always to tell them the truth because the truth will always set them free and that's what John does yes it's always supposed to be done with love listen to what he has to tell them he warns them to flee from the wrath to come these people already know what's happening it's in them I was sharing the gospel with the man on Friday. And I said this to him. I said, you know inside that one day you're going to give an account to God. He's not a Christian. This is what he said to me. I shared the gospel and he said, well, you know, I'm a good guy. I used to be a bad guy. You know, I don't do that no more. I don't do any of those things. This is what I said to him. Who's going to pay for your past sins? Well, I'm doing a lot better now. So they'll kind of equal out. Is that how it works? So in other words, I want you to do a lot of good stuff for the next 25 years and that should cover your sins. It doesn't work like that. The Bible says that God in his word says every single person will give an account. You can't make up for the, or pay for the sins you've already committed. Christ came to pay for the sins you've committed and forgiveness is only through Christ and Christ only. Period. A man will enter into heaven or a woman will enter into heaven or a child will enter into heaven because of Jesus and what he's done on the cross and that's the only way to heaven. 
But he warns them about the wrath. There's a wrath coming. There's an accountability. Let's look at that for one moment. Again. The Bible teaches that every man will stand before God and give an account for their sins. Non-Christian. Non-Christian. People who reject Christ, they'll stand before God and they'll be judged and condemned, the Bible teaches. Because no one paid for their sins, even though Jesus did. They didn't receive the payment. But then there's another one as a Christian. The Bible says, you will not be judged for your sins. You will not be given account for your sins, but you'll give an account for the gifts and the talents that God has given you. That's called the Bema Seek Judgment. So, it is important that we understand this concerning why John is saying this. He's not just being, I'm going to be mean. And I, I'm, he isn't doing that. He's telling them because he knows that the Messiah is coming. Time is short. And he's trying to prepare them. And in the moment, you're going to see they totally respond to it. Now, look at me for a second. How do you respond to things that are hard? How do you respond? In our nature, this is what we can say. You know what, I would have probably listened to what Pastor had to say this morning, but you know what, I didn't like the way he said that. You know, he, he, didn't, he, he didn't put it the way I think he should have put it. So I'm just going to null and void it. That's foolishness. It's not what, it's not how I'm putting it forth, it's what I'm saying, the contents of what is being said. It's so important. Now listen to what he, John says. And so he says to these people, Therefore, bear fruit worthy of repentance, and do not begin to say to yourself, We are Abraham's as our father. We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And John really lays it on the, uh, on the line. He says, Therefore, bear fruit of repentance. There are a lot of people who have a false sense of security, beloved of knowing God who are not living the way that they should Jesus said why do you call me Lord Lord and do not do the things which I say beloved which do you think God is more interested in profession or practice John the Baptist says here to bear fruit worthy of repentance in other words let your life be consistent with your words Hey, look at me again. If you're a Christian, raise your hand and you call yourself a Christian. Raise your hand. I'm a Christian too. Don't be ashamed of it. Be proud that you're a Christian. But I say this. Does your life reflect being a Christian? Is there fruit that comes out of your life that says, I'm a Christian when I'm at work, when I'm at play, when I'm at school, during the day, or whatever it may be? When I'm in my home and I'm the only one there, are my husband with me, are my wife with me, are my children? Am I a Christian? Am I bearing fruit in what the Bible teaches concerning what I say I am? What I watch on television, am I a Christian? Where I go, am I a Christian? Who I hang around with is so important it is one thing to know God and it's quite another to know about God. Paul encouraged us to examine ourselves for he said if you would judge yourselves we would not be judged. It is possible that you are one of those who Paul speaks about those who are in the church who profess to know God but who actually deny him by their works. Is that possible? Have you allowed other gods to supersede your love for him? Or is he really your first love, our first in your life? Beloved, don't just profess your faith. Practice it as well. Listen to what he says in the second part. Do not begin to say to yourself we have Abraham as our father for if I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham for these stones 
Beloved, they were resting upon their covenant that God had made with Abraham and to his seed forever. And thus, recognizing that the covenant, they would say, well, we have Abraham as our father. And that was sort of an excuse of any kind of a lifestyle they wanted to live. You see, the Bible teaches that our lives are to reflect what we believe. And even these descendants of Abraham, John the Baptist said, uh-uh. Now, he goes on in verse 9, and even now, <laughs> the axe is laid at the root of the tree. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Most of you know who Matthew Henry was. He writes this concerning this verse. Barren trees will be cast into the fire at length. It is the fittest place for them. Every tree that does not bring forth fruit, good fruit, is hewed down and cast into the fire. If it serves not for fruit, to the honor of God's grace, let it serve for fuel to the honor of justice. So the people asked him, saying, what shall we do then? And here's a perfect place to be as a Christian. When God begins to speak to you about something you need to deal with in your life that he wants to change, you need to be saying, what do I need to do, God? I'm willing to do it no matter what. These people's hearts are in the perfect place, and this is where we want to be. And John answers them, he who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. And he who has no food, let him do likewise. In other words, he said, start thinking about others and helping the needs of others. Start caring about others, not just yourself and what you need. And the tax collectors also came to him to be baptized. And he said, teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, collect no more than what is appointed to you. The tax collectors were hated by the Jews because they literally took advantage of people. They would be workers of Rome and they would have to collect a certain amount and then they would add to it over abundantly and overtax the people. And they were hated by the Jew regular Jewish people. And John speaks to them, don't be crooked. Be fair with these people. Only take a little more. Don't take a lot more. And then he finishes in verse 14. Likewise, the soldiers asked him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said to them, Do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely, and be content with your wages. So two things he mainly says to these men. The first one, is, he says this. Do not intimidate or falsely accuse. In other words, don't take bribes. Don't be crooks as a policeman. As people in authority, don't be crooks. And then he tells them to be content with their wages. It's hard at times to be content, isn't it? With what you have. And wanting more can get us into trouble. Many times. Listen to this story. A man is walking down the beach and comes across an old bottle. He picks it up, pulls out the cork, and out pops a genie. The genie says, thank you for freeing me from the bottle. In return, I will grant you three wishes. The man says, great. I always dreamed of this, and I know exactly what I want. First, I want one billion dollars in a Swiss bank account. Poof. There is a flash in the light, and a piece of paper with an account number appears in his hand. He continues, next, I want a brand new red Ferrari right here. Poof. There in the flash and in the light, the bright red brand new Ferrari appears right next to him. He continues, finally I want to be irresistible to women. Poof! There is a flash of light and he turns into a box of chocolates. <laughs> Gotta be careful what you ask for. Paul said godliness with contentment is great gain. I believe that we can be content without a doubt if we trust God with our lives 
and he's our first love, we put him first in our life, I believe that we will lack nothing. Now, so what must I do to prepare to meet God? I believe that the same thought that John had when Jesus first came is the same thought, our first thought that we should have concerning our own personal life to meet God. You've heard me say this before. I believe that we live in the last days. I believe that Christ is coming in our lifetime. And I believe that God wants us to prepare to meet, to meet him. And I believe that the first thing he, we have to deal with is his own heart. And that comes by being honest with God. That comes by saying, okay, Lord, is there anything within me that would hinder my relationship with you, anything within me that I need to repent of? Just because it's law in our land doesn't mean that God agrees with it. In this last week, there's a woman running for, is going to be running for president. And in her life before this, she believed that prostitution was horrible. That it was abuse of women. That it would cause more problems than ever before. But because she's running for president and she's trying to get more votes, she made the statement this week that she, if she becomes president, prostitution is going to be legalized in the whole United States in every state, every county. I'm not shocked at all. But what if it is legal, 100%? Well, if it's legal, then I guess it's okay, right? If abortion's legal, then I guess it's okay. If pornography's legal, I guess it's okay. If it, child pornography's legal, I guess it's okay. And it goes on and on and on. All these things, God calls them sin. All of them. And they hurt our relationship with God, and they make us unprepared for what God says making us ready to meet him. So I say this with in mind. You know what sin is. Not what people say it is or what the world says it is. You know what sin is. I know within my own heart when I do something, if I say a lie or if I get angry or say something that I shouldn't say or whatever it may be, the Holy Spirit convicts me. I know it's sin. He doesn't convict me to say, you know what, that's not sin. Now I can null and void that and say, you know what? I don't hear it. I don't hear it. I don't hear it. And after a while, I won't hear it. It's true. But we know what sin is. And you know what you need to deal with with your heart concerning God this morning. If you're not a Christian this morning, you've never become born again, truly born again, and your life has not changed. And the first thing you need to do is repent and accept Christ as your Lord and Savior because the Holy Spirit is working in you to become born again. If not, you're pushing him away. And you ain't going to be ready to meet God. And if you're a Christian today, it'd be a sad thing because there are people who believe this. I don't know where I stand on this one. But if I'm in deliberate disobedience to God and the rapture of the church happens, I would not want to be left behind here because we know what's going to happen and we learn through it, the revelations. So my point is, get serious concerning anything you need to repent of. Anything that you've been playing with. You know, it's so easy to hide ourselves in our homes and watch things on television or get on the internet or anything else. It's so easy to become drinkers and it's okay. We don't, it's okay. God will forgive me. No. Let's bow our hearts this morning. I told you when I first began this, I believe the most miraculous thing that happens is a changed heart. And I believe that God wants to do that today, but it comes literally. 
on our part of responding and confessing and repenting. Father, first of all, we want to thank you for the Word of God. We want to thank you for the Word of God. And Father, we know that your Word is the truth, Lord God. And we know that the truth sets us free. So we ask God that you'd reveal to us this morning anything, Father, that we have, we lack. That, Father, we choose contrary to you, Lord. And Lord, you are not a condemner when it comes to your, your children. You are, we call you Father. And as a father who loves his children, works in their hearts, and keeps them from things that are contrary or even chastens them, Lord. You do that with us, Lord God, because you love us. And Lord, it's our heart this morning that we want to be prepared to meet you, Lord God. So Father, we ask God that if there's something that we need to confess to you, Lord, that Father, you would bring it to light. David said, search my heart, Lord. And see if there be any iniquity, Lord. See if there be any sin. And Lord, we ask that this morning, Lord. And Father, as we learned this morning, first point is confession, admission, Lord. The second point, Lord, is, is repentance, Lord. Father, not just feeling sorry or feeling, Father, contrite, Lord, but we're feeling, Father, broken. And, Father, turning away. Father, you know what we're doing. We know what we've done already, Lord God. And you're willing to forgive. But you're also, Father, give us the power to turn away from that, Lord, by the Holy Spirit. So, Father, break any bondages, Lord God, that we would, that sin would have in us, Lord God, that we may walk as freedom, and free, Lord God, that you may bear the fruit in our hearts and in our lives, Lord, that only you can by the Holy Spirit, God. And Father, change every heart this morning, God. Prepare every heart this morning, God. Make those paths straight that are crooked, Lord God. And now, Lord, we want to thank you, God, for your forgiveness. I want to thank you for the breaking of things, Lord God, that need to be broken. And the freedom that we experience through Christ. Bear fruit through each one of us, Lord, in our lives. And continue that great work of preparation that only you can do by the Spirit and the Word of God. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Let us stand this morning. If you need prayer... There'll be people up here. Let, let me say this before you take, we take off and dismiss you. I'll be, oh, Dave's up here. Okay, good. We encourage you to come up and kneel before the Lord this morning. They'll be doing some worship songs two or three times, three, two or three songs. And we encourage you to come up and kneel and pray and talk to the Lord. Now is a good time to do that. Now is a good time to be intimate with God. And if you need to weep before God, weep before God. Whatever you need to do, do it. Don't let pride or anything else stop you from yielding your heart to God this morning. And let God continue to work in you. May God richly bless you. May you continue to know your God in a greater and greater way every time and every day you spend time with Him. May God work like only God can work and may you be prepared to meet the Lord. We're going to sing a couple songs. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.